Okay. Cool, you guys can. Let's quickly start with our today's class. But before starting with today's class, let's set up on the agenda that we're going to complete today. As you already discussed, this is a lower level design. So three classes we have been assigned, including the previous one, which we had on Sunday last week. So we have only two classes, or that is the weekend that is going to be the last classes of your batch. What are we going to cover in today's class? Let's have a quick idea. What is the syllabus of our low level design? First, need to understand what is there to cover in the low level design, then how we complete it, right? So we talked about the requirement gathering. All of this I'm going to revise as well, but I'm just setting the agenda what we're going to cover today. So we talked about the requirement gathering. We talked about laying down the use cases. This is where we'll start from today. Object-oriented programming versus object-oriented design. I remember I've studied some of the, I've showed you some of the UML diagrams and I have shown you how the UML diagrams work, the relations, et cetera, et cetera. We'll come to that, but even before coming to that, I understand that some of you lack very basic knowledge of object-oriented design. So that's why I decided to cover Opus is object-oriented design. We'll talk about basics of classes and objects. I will not spend much time here because I believe everybody knows the difference between classes and objects here. Then we'll talk about how do you identify which relationship to be scarified and how the relationship between classes work. For that, we'll talk about NBT technique. In last class, somebody told that use a case study, that would be much easier. I totally relate to that. So I'll prefer keeping a case study or one real life example. And then for a real life example, we can make class diagram, we can make use case diagram, sequence diagram, activity diagram, whatever diagrams we need to make, right? But better to make it with a real world diagram. So we'll keep a case study for that. Once we're done with this, then we'll start with the different class relations. So different class relations include association, aggregation, composition, all of this, that is what we're going to discuss. Then we'll talk about how do you assign responsibilities to a class? What are the different relations between classes as I just mentioned? And then we'll cover the UML diagram. So my agenda for covering today is that we're going to complete all of this and post completing all of this, tomorrow class will be just pending with the solid principles because solid principle is going to take at least one complete class. I mean, it might not take one complete class, one and a half hour or one hour is sufficient for it. But just for reference and few doubt session that you guys have my tomorrow, that's why I'm keeping solid for tomorrow. Apart from that, anything which is there in the low level design, in the modular programming, our component level design, that's what we're going to complete and finish today. Okay. So class might be extended, might not be extended. We have to roughly two or 10 minutes. That is sufficient enough to cover these subjects. Okay. So we're revising our last class, 18th of June. We have started with the WhatsApp system design. That was the last system design we have covered. We talked about what have we done in the asset delivery service? What is the purpose of asset delivery service? Which options as an asset we can send? Images, files, videos, etc. Then we talked about when asset is sent out, it will be compressed and encrypted at the sender side. And then encrypted content is sent to the receiver side. So that's why we called it end-to-end -end encryption, both from the client side as well as from the server side, right? Even while the content will be received in encrypted form and it will be decrypted at the receiver end. That's what we discussed. So somebody asked what happens in the resolution? Why does the size decreases? Size decreases because the pixels decrease, right? Or technically speaking, resolution per pixel decreases. So it's all about the resolution that we have in the DPIs. Okay, we talked about the scenario four when user U1 is sending an image to U2 because prior to that, we have talked about the chat communication and text messages. Let's see what happens when you are sending any asset, right? It can be any call, it can be any message, it can be image, video or anything, right? Now, when the sender will upload the image to a server and then it will get the image ID, that image ID will be sent to the receiver, whatever you do. Now we know that web server handler, this is going to be a lightweight server, right? So we cannot keep any heavy logic in the web socket handler. And ideally speaking, you should follow a very good design principle that you'll hear from many distinguished engineers, principal engineers and architects is that it should be a dumb client and a smart server. That kind of architecture is always the best. Well, some people might disagree with me. Some people might have their own thought process, but generally speaking, the less logic you will keep at the client side, the more UI UX experience is going to enhance or boost up for your end customer, right? So that's why we all place that whenever you want to make a good architecture, a good product, keep it as, a, as dumb as a client and as smart as a server. So when in the server also, you have lightweight and heavyweight server. In the lightweight server, just pass it for just delivering whatever it is delivering. All the business logic, all the data logic should be kept at the heavyweight servers or the data servers, right? Now, my WebSocket handler is a lightweight server, so it doesn't make sense that I'm going to implement any logic here, right? So what should happen? My image should be compressed at the sender end and sent to the asset service. That should not happen by WebSocket handler. WebSocket handler task is, it will just tell me which users are connected to me. That's it, nothing else. So my asset service will store the content on S3 bucket. It's not necessarily S3. Based on the kind of traffic S3 received for a particular image, video, or a content, my asset service will load the content into CDN. 
if a particular file has been extended multiple times, shared across multiple times, asked across multiple times, then it is better to load that content into CDN. Why? Because CDN works as a cache, usually works as a cache, and it is much faster lookup for delivering of static networks. Once the image is loaded in the S3, message service will provide the image ID to you too, and they'll communicate via WSH. Here I told you about one performance optimization we can do. As we know, one particular image is uploaded thousands of times or millions of times. In that case, what I'm going to do is rather than uploading this image millions of times or thousands of times, I can take a hash of it and then I can compare the hash whether it is already present, right? If it is already present, then I don't need to upload it. Now the question comes, how are you going to check the hash? So if I'm going to check one hash, then the probability of collisions will definitely be there. Why? We are dealing with the scale of WhatsApp with the, over a 1 billion active users. And it's just 1 billion active users. We're talking about 50 billion messages on an average. Out of those 50 billion messages, let's say even 10% are images. I'm not saying everybody sends the images, right? So just 10% I'm taking. 50 billion, 10% is also 5 billion. You're talking about 5 billion data that you need to transfer, data points you need to transfer. There is a very high chances of collision. And that is we are talking about every day, okay? So what we do is if we are going to compare across multiple hashes, whatever hash algorithms are present here, if all the hashes matches, then we can be probably good sure. I'm not saying 100% sure, but we can be 99% sure that this is a high chance. This is the same content, okay? So we're not going to upload it again. Then we talked about the user service and group service. The user service stores the user related information. It can be done in a SQL database because all content would be same. In group service, group service maintains all the group related information, for example, which user belongs to which group, user IDs, group IDs, time creation of group, time when the user was added, status, group icon, description, et cetera, et cetera. It can be again kept in SQL DB because all groups have the same follow. It can be geography. Obviously, both of them will be geographically distributed to reduce latency, group service as well as user service. Then we talked about the analytics service. What do you mean by analytics service? Every action which is performed by the user, they can be used. Technically, let's call it event. Let's not call it action for much easier use case. Let's call it event. So every event which is performed by the user can be used for some sort of analysis. Now, what do I mean by some sort of analysis? Even when you're changing your profile picture, that is also an event. Even when you're seeing your last scene, changing your last scene, et cetera, that is also an event. You're watching status, that is also an event. You are watching profile picture of a particular contact in your history, that is also an event, right? So every kind of event can be triggered. For example, if I want to run an API and I want to understand close to of course there are many factors when i say close to it can be in degree number of chats it can be in terms of how many times you view their profile how many times you see their last scene make a video call make an audio call whatever all of this is an event and they can be used for some sort of analysis right similarly if a person talks about a lot of sports we can tag them as sport enthusiast we can tag them as um let's say they are into football and you share an image which contains a particular famous footballer let's say Lionel messi for example or ronaldo in that case, we can tag, okay, you are a fan of this particular group and so on and so forth. Now, of course, the question comes here, if the chats are end-to-end -end encrypted, how do you know it's a sports event? So for that, we use something called signals. If you don't know about Spark streaming service, I will highly recommend that you just Google Hadoop plus store Spark streaming services. Again, I repeat the same thing because I cannot disclose the entire things, but very basic things I'm repeating, it is very possible to understand signals to a very high precision, if not accuracy what the invert the context is talking about you cannot read the chats that's for sure but without reading the chat you can get very strong signals what the chat is regarding about right it can be sharing the link across it can be sharing across the media across right a lot of times you share the links across so chats are not in chats are encrypted right you cannot read the chats but you can read the redirects so you're sending the link to amazon you're sending the link to some whatever and any particular football event or something like that right all of those can be tracked so if the event was sending about this, we can tag similarly sports, football, violence, politics. All of this, all of these events from Kafka are sent to the Spark streaming service, which runs on the top of a Hadoop clusters, multiple Hadoop clusters. So they run a lot of queries. I have highlighted the word lot specifically because they run billions of queries every day. Okay. And that helps us to get the analysis what a particular user is most related to. And a lot of information, not just most related to. You can be a sport enthusiast, you can be a politics enthusiast whom you are most closest to, vice versa, a lot of things can be taken out, okay? Then we talked about the last scene service. In the last scene service, I mentioned you, there are two kinds of events. What are the two kinds of events? One is the app event, one is the user event. App event means think something which a user is not doing. For example, you connected with the network, either a mobile data or a Wi-Fi, doesn't matter, or even a LAN connection. 
as soon as you get connected to the as soon as you get connected to the internet what is going to happen is your client which is the whatsapp server which is the whatsapp application on your device it is going to make a connection to a web socket handler so you didn't do anything right you didn't go to whatsapp and say hey i want to own the whatsapp it's running in the background so things like a web socket handler is connected client making connection etc etc these events are not done by the user hence they will not be tracked by the last seen service so when you say the user was last seen on this and this time you are technically talking about when the person actually opened the app the moment you open the app or close the app or do anything in the app let's say change your profile picture or even if you don't change it you just go to settings you just go to profile all of these are user events because you chose to open the app right that will be updated in the last scene so whenever you say the last scene of the user is updated it's not when they are online or it's not when they are connected it's when they last opened the whatsapp okay that is what you mean by last scene service and of course that last seen service has to be synchronized across multiple devices what does that mean let's say you didn't open the whatsapp via mobile but you did open the whatsapp via laptop or by via smartwatch so that should be synchronized across devices if you guys follow me on medium i shared an article how does that synchronization work how does that md5 connect with all the synchronization devices and if you guys don't know at one moment you can start the whatsapp at five devices concurrently means i can open the whatsapp in my mobile in my smartwatch in my laptop and two other devices so at one time you can synchronize across five devices that is the limit that we support as of now so if you guys have seen it on medium you guys can read it on my medium article if you have not read it then it's okay then it's totally fine too i'll share the link later then we talked about monitoring and logging which is the last part all the components we discuss are horizontally scalable what does that means i can get more instances and i can scale as and when required so we'll be monitoring the cpu utilization of all our services definitely we'll check the latency of all web services disk utilization of kafka and databases all of these monitoring and tools are available by some of the very common tools like grafana and kibana i'm pretty much sure majority of you would have heard this name or if not you would have used this as well on your job right if not just google about kibana and grafana and they're not free to use as far as i know but you can pretty much get insights about it how do you check the logs and etc all those things so based upon a monitoring and alerts we can write scripts to automate some actions as a good engineer on the sre side or as a devops engineer well technically sre words should not be used the right terms is to use devops as a good engineer on the devops side you should be able to automate the scripts because it doesn't make sense that you are you are doing a manual invention for something which can be automated right so 80% instead of sending messages to everyone that hey your disk storage is about to end you can simply automate you can spin up another kubernetes instance or whatever db instances you are going to use right so all of this can be automated at the server side end this marks the end of our whatsapp system design we have talked about the com detailed component of diagram as well so here is our high level design which ends here then we move to low level design and i told you the difference i told you the first approach what you are going to follow in the low level design what are the syllabus so and so forth here is the detailed syllabus as i just mentioned okay we started with the difference between hld and ld first hld is going to be my top down approach where i talk about client server different services the database the data flow load balancing caching monitoring logging etc etc right and then fall back option the partitioning options all of those things i mentioned about in my low level design we need to start with something called requirement gathering first of all what is low level basically low level design does not just mean code low level does not just mean the diagrams that you are going to create low level design means once you have finalized okay first of all you always start with high level design never with the low level design just to be clear okay any new problem statement is given any new system design you are going to make first thing is that you are going to design the high level diagram like, uh, that is why it is called the high level why you make on a high level what are going to be different components of my system how they are going to connect what services i might or might not need what is going to be the database what is going to be the partitioning strategy how the data is going to flow across different components if i need to use load balancer caching monitoring logging how will it look like that is why it is called the high level diagram once you make the high level diagram then you dig down deeper into the low level diagram in the low level diagram you talked about what are going to be different components so to understand the components and changes between because ultimately everything in everything in the with this software engineering world it boils down to classes and objects of course in functional programming you might say that there is no classes so let's keep it very generic everything boils down to classes and functions at the end no matter how complex the system is you take example of whatsapp you take example of instagram no matter how complex it looks like at the end of the day it's just classes and functions which are working at the end of the day right to reach from that this high level design to this component or this classes and diagram that process is called low level design 
So that you go step by step. The very first step is that you understand the requirement gathering, what are going to be the requirement for each specific system. Okay. Then you lay down the use cases. Who are going to be my stakeholders? What are the use cases? We don't call stakeholders. We say actors in our system, right? Actors means anything which is contributing in my system. I'll come to all of that one by one. Then you create the UML diagrams. UML diagrams, just class diagram is just one part of UML diagrams. You make the UML diagram, which is unified modeling language. That's why it is called unified modeling language. It's not specific to any language. So I'm going to tell about how my data is going to flow across different services or different classes or different models or different abstractions. Once I'm clear with how the data flow, then I can talk about the sequence diagram, activity diagram, and various other sort of things. Then you model them to the real life problem and finally implement in the code. So this is what low level design is in overall. And this is what high level design as we have completed. Okay. Now I start this one by one. What do you mean by requirement gathering? Requirement gathering means I need to analyze what is the exact system that I'm going to build. Okay. For example, a very generous statement will be given to you is that you need to build a low level design for a parking lot system. Very famous interview problem, something we can refer as uh, when we'll go for case study as well. Very popular. So let's keep it to stick. Now, when you say I'm going to build a low level design or we need to build a low level design for a parking lot system. Now you need to understand the requirement gathering here. Is it going to be one level parking versus multi-level parking? Why? I might need to create a sub super class. Super class means a parent class, or I might not need to create a parent class if it's a one level parking. Which type of vehicle I'm supporting? Is it one type of vehicle or multiple type of vehicle? So if it's just one type of vehicle, like let's say car, I can just keep one class car and I can implement all the functionalities in it. But if it is multiple type of vehicles, in that case, I will create a class vehicle and then I will extend it to multiple other child classes. For example, it can be cars, it can be trucks, it can be bikes, right? So my design will change completely if it's going to be one type of vehicle versus multiple type of vehicle. Similarly, it can be one place or spread across the settings. Again, my design will change. One user, multiple users, my design will change. All of these questions are need to be asked before, right? That's why it is called requirement gathering. A one resource book which I recommended, which is really, really good, quite an old book, almost 30 years now. This book is Design Patterns, Elements of Reusable Object-Oriented Software, right? This is hardcover, which is the part of the book. So I shared the Amazon link if you guys want to read it. This book was read 30 years ago, on, well, pretty much 30 years ago. It was written in 1995. This book was written by Gang of Four. I'll talk about Gang of Four later and go to the solid principles or the object-oriented design patterns. Four C++ engineers who have written that every kind of design pattern in this world, software engineering design patterns in this world, they can be clubbed into 23 software patterns, right? So they made four categories. Inside four categories, there are 23 different design patterns. And pretty much even after about 30 years, there, I'm not saying that there are not design patterns which are not discovered after it. There are many design patterns which are discovered after. But all those design patterns still can be fit into those 23 design patterns which they have listed. And these four were amazing software engineers. If you want to read more about it, just Google Gang of Four. They were popular as Gang of Four engineers. Okay. Anyways, let's move on to the next part, which is laying down use cases. What is laying down use cases? That every stakeholder in my system, who is a stakeholder in my system, who is associated with my system in one or the other way. Okay. So every stakeholder in my system, which we call as actor, will have their own use cases in the system. Example. I'm working on a project, let's say online banking business, and I have to make a system for online banking business. Now, who are my actors here or who are my stakeholders here? It can be a customer, it can be admin, or it can be a bank user, right? Admin can be different from bank user or bank users can be different apart from the admin, right? On a customer, they can do anything which is available in the net banking, update balance, transaction, use whatever features available in that. On the admin side, I can keep lock and unlock functionality because that is something which only admin should be allowed. In my bank users, there are many other people apart from the admin. There's a specific admin and only they have the access to lock and lock. Not all bank users should have the access for that. But other bank users, for example, they can help you resolve frauds. They can have your customer support and et cetera things. So they can look into your account. They can tell that, hey, this transaction happened at this date and was given to this and that. But they cannot lock or unlock your account, right? One example that I'm giving you is, I'm not sure how it works in India because it's a long time I've not been in banks in India, but Okay, let me give an example. When you go to bank in India, I'm just taking a very simple example and please correct me if it is wrong because I've, I'm not in India since a long time or at least not in the bank in India. There are certain people who are on the office staff and then there is a manager, right? So I think they are called clerks. They're clerks and manager, right? Let's say you go for a basic task that I have to update your passport. In case you need to update your passport, any clerk can do that. You don't need to go to the manager. All agree? 
they all are bank users. They all are bank employees, right? They have the admin, they have the access, but not everybody has the admin access. So when you just go for a very basic mere minimum task that I need to update the passbook or I need to submit a check, you don't need to really go to a manager. Clerks can also do the same, right? But if something very, very important comes, for example, you have to lock the account or you have to close the account. In that case, you need the manager signature there. So similar example you can take is not all bank users are admin users, right? So you will need some admin privileges which are given to only specific users in the bank, right? And not all other users in the bank are given those access. That is the example which I have taken. So these three becomes my stakeholders for actors in the system. Then we talked about UML diagrams, types and purpose. Very first thing, what is the full form of UML? UML full form is unified modeling language. There's a reason it is called unified. It is not specific to any language. Whatever you code in at the back end or the client side doesn't matter. You have to make a UML diagram to understand your system, data flow of your system, and how the relationships are established between the classes. Okay. Even in your functional programming, some people might say that in my functional programming, I'm not going to keep classes. Fine. You can keep done channels. You can keep other things. You can keep just functional programming aspects. But even in that case, you need to understand who are going to be the stakeholders, what are going to be the sequence diagram, right? So UML diagram is just not limited or restricted to class diagram, just to be clear, okay? It's very well there for functional programming as well. So anybody Golang developer here, they, that's what I'm referring to, okay? Now, converting certain requirements into diagrams. So what I'm going to convert is whatever certain diagrams are available, whatever requirements are available, I need to convert into different set of diagrams. Now, when we say UML diagrams, they're categorized into three different categories. One is structural, one is behavioral, one is interaction. What do you mean by this? Structural diagrams represent how is going to be the structural changes follow in my system. Behavioral means how the behavior of the components happen in my system. And interaction means how does the interaction happens between different components of my system. That's why they're categorized into three categories. In our structural diagram, there is class diagram, component, object, deployment, package, and composite structure. These are the diagrams. In my behavioral diagram, I have activity diagram, state machine diagram, use case diagram. And in my interaction diagram, I have communication, timing, and sequence diagrams. Out of all this, you don't need to read everything. You want to read, definitely go ahead and read it. But the most important one that you must know, every engineer should must know, is your class diagram, your activity diagram, your use case diagram, and sequence diagram. And this is something which you are going to do on a very daily basis. Okay. As a software engineer, as a not even not as a fresher, but definitely as a senior engineer, you're definitely going to work every day with, on an everyday basis or every project that you're going to work, you're going to work for that. So you are going to project proposals, you're going to write their high level design and low level design part. Okay. I'll show you the images of all UML diagrams one by one. I think I've shown you again. I will show you again. And then class diagram we discussed in the last class. Anyways, we're going to again open the class diagram and we're going to do. One more thing, one thing extra that I'm doing here is I'm going to show you how you actually make a class diagram, right? So rather than just showing you a screenshot or an image, I'm going to show you how you exactly do it. So think it like an interview, how are you going to do it? So I'm going to use draw.io. In, in case you guys don't not heard it, please just Google draw.io and just open that. That is what we're going to use for our class diagrams or any kind of diagrams. All right, this all UML diagrams, I'm just going to show you the image again. Just give me one minute. There we have all UML diagrams. And there you go. Okay. This is what I was referring about. So this we have in the all UML diagrams. This is behavioral diagram, this is structural diagram, and then we have the interaction diagram. So four important for our use case. These are going to be, just checking it here, activity diagram, use case diagram, sequence diagram, and of course my class diagram. These four are going to be important for me. All right, guys, that is in the revision. Now let's switch over to today's class and finish it. All right, now it looks much better. Now I can see everything. All right, I believe all of you guys can see the class diagram. Don't worry about what I've created. This is created by default. I have not created it, okay? All you have to do is just go to this website, apps.diagram.net. I'm just going to share the link here. This is called draw.io. So pretty much you can create any kind of diagram you want. I'll show you from scratch. How did I create it? Just click on that website. Go here. Okay. Let it open. Okay. Just click on create new diagram. That's it. Right. So you'll find all kinds of diagrams here. Are you guys able to see my screen? All kinds of diagrams are available here. You can see a class diagram. You can see a flow chart. You can see a simlane diagram, ER diagram, cross-functional, Kanban board, and simple diagram as well. Right. Sequence diagram also. 
if you don't find it, you can find it here inside the tables, inside the engineering, inside the flowcharts. Pretty much every kind of diagrams are available here. You can get the template or you can create your own as well, right? So I'm just going to start with the class diagram. I'm going to create a create. It is going to ask me where I'm going to save it. So I'm just saying test.io, something like this, save it. Okay. Can you increase the font? Sure. Increase the font. Okay. I'm just showing you how do you open desk.draw.io and how do you save it. We are not changing anything right now because we have to do some discussions. Then we'll talk about class diagram. But in the meantime, everybody just go to this link. Just create a simple class diagram. This is the default class diagram. I have not changed anything here. Simple class diagram that we have. Everybody was done with this step. Please type that in the chat so we can go to the next part. Come on, guys. Be quick. Once everybody is done with that, please type down in the chat so we can go to the next part. Easy. Just go to draw.io, just simply create a class diagram and just save it there. That's it. Okay. Majority of you have said yes. Let's move on to next. Let's come here. Okay. The link is already there. I pasted the link app.diagrams.net. Okay. Cool. Now we are going to start with object oriented programming versus object oriented design. Let's have this discussion first. Then I'll move to classes and objects. Then we'll discuss the further part. Okay. Let's start with this first. And this is going to be an interesting discussion. What is object oriented programming? What is OOP first of all? OOP is object oriented programming. This is something which you probably would have been reading since your school time, not even college time, since your school time, right? This you might not have read during your school time, but you might have read it during your college time. Again, depends on curriculum to curriculum, might or might not have. This is object oriented design. Everybody's completely clear with the full form, right? And I'm pretty much sure some of you might, everybody should be clear with this also, because since you're reading it from school, so you should definitely know what it is. Some of you might be clear with this. Some of you might not be clear with this. Although I discussed in the last class, like very exactly what do you mean by object to design, but that's totally fine if you're not very clear with it. What my question here is, anybody can just explain me in one line. I don't want a Google answer. I don't want a detailed answer or a chat GPT answer. Just a simple one line. What is the difference between versus object oriented design? Repeating the question again, what is the difference between an object oriented programming and object oriented design? Is there a difference? If yes, what is the difference? Just one line, whatever understanding, whatever words you want to use in which you can best convey your message, feel free to use that. Okay. I'm giving you guys two minutes. Two minutes is sufficient for this one. Please change your message directly to me. There is no right or wrong answers here. I just want to know your understanding, what you have understood so far by object-oriented design. Object-oriented programming, I'm 100% sure you should have. You should be very clear with it, at least now. Okay. Please change your message directly to me while you're giving the answer. Please give answer in only one line at max two. Don't, I don't want, I want any stressed answer. What is the difference between O versus double OD? Quickly let me know in the chat. 30 seconds on the clock. Please change your message directly to me. Your time starts now. Maximum one to two minutes for this one. Okay, be quick, guys. Just be quick. Last one minute or last few seconds. When you tell the difference, also tell me, can I use object oriented programming without object oriented design? So let me ask you this two questions. Can I use OOP without OD? Yes or no? And same question for other way around. So copy this, paste it. Answer this question also. Okay. You can simply answer like this. One is yes, no, whatever you want to answer. And second is yes, no. That also you can answer. Okay. Come guys, I want everyone's participation. That is the reason I've changed the message to directly to me. I don't want you guys to be disturbed by anybody else's answer. Whatever you think, right? Whatever in your understanding, just let me know. This question itself is incorrect. That also you can let me know, right? But I want your understanding. There is no right or wrong answer at this moment. And then we'll clear everything. 
be quick guys then we have to move to the next part okay let's discuss now cool we start with first oop right object under programming reading through a lot of years you should all be clear with it right i'll just talk on a very brief level then we have to go to class and objects that we're going to going to cover briefly right we don't need to spend much time here because i assume everybody's clear with the concept of class and objects few things i will definitely clear out difference between abstraction and in, and encapsulation which is definitely taught you wrong in schools and colleges if i if i say not wrong it's not taught to the level which should have been taught and how it is used in the real life programming so that part i'll clear it but apart from that i'm not going to dig much deeper into inheritance and all those things you already have cleared it right coming to object oriented programming first what is object oriented programming of course there are pillars of there are four pillars what are these everybody knows inheritance polymorphism abstraction and encapsulation you have heard these four terms you will definitely know the meaning of these four terms nothing to explain here pillars i am not explaining what is object oriented programming when i say i am going to write an object oriented code or object oriented programming code what does that mean that means you are writing coding up an application or a program whatever you are coding using the object oriented features of a particular language what does that mean okay let me ask you a very interesting question is java object oriented programming language or not is java object oriented programming language or not everybody says yes okay does any program i write in java will be object oriented program any program that i write in java will be object oriented program not necessarily give me an example show me one program in java which is not object oriented now you can message to everyone we are having generic discussion now you can message to everyone print factorial numbers okay why it is not object oriented only if we write classes as per real world objects it will be to object oriented programming then what is object oriented design anyways i am not going to take much deeper into this understand and ask this ask this question to yourself why certain languages why certain languages are called functional languages i hope everybody has heard this term right c++ java um uh, php all of these are your object oriented languages right including kotlin as well but there are some functional languages also for example golang so what is the criteria which defines a language will be a functional language or it is going to be object oriented language what is that baseline what is that criteria to define right so when we are going to write an application or a program using the object oriented features of a particular language that what we call as oops or object oriented programming right now object oriented features i have mentioned of a particular language what do we call by od or object oriented design object oriented design comes when you take a real world problem real world problem using object oriented design techniques okay you take a real world problem you use the object oriented design techniques and concepts to solve it now design techniques are very different from oops design technique can be solid principle it can be dry it can be case it can be many other right best programming principles you can talk about in object oriented design okay you can still write now coming to the question what i asked you can still write an object oriented programming which actually violates the object oriented design principle while violating object oriented design principle what does that mean very simple example i am giving the solid principles the s stands for single responsibility okay understand responsibility as a function so technically speaking one class should be given one specific function or one specific task agree 
very basic i'm explaining solid i'll give you detail and when we are completed with this tomorrow probably i'll go in solid but just for simplicity this solid is an acronym the s stand for single responsibility principle means every one class should be given one responsibility right now can you stop a programmer from giving two responsibilities or two functions to a class can you technically stop them no right it's their code they can write as many classes why they have to follow your standards that's why i'm saying understand the difference between oop and object oriented design very clearly object oriented programming means there is a certain language which is object oriented i am coding up a program following that object oriented features of that language that becomes my oop program it may or may not follow the object oriented design that's why it is always said not every code is a good code everybody can code but everybody cannot good write code everybody cannot give a good code right so every code that you are doing does not necessarily is following the object oriented design and that's why it's some and important to understand what are these object oriented design what are the best design principles and why are they required because you can literally write any code in one class but does it make sense to write everything in one class why do you need to split the class what kind of relationship this class should have etc etc then the concept of coupling comes in tight coupling loose coupling etc etc right but as far as a program is concerned you can write any program which may or may not follow any kind of principles so you can write a object oriented program which will violate the object oriented design principles reverse is not true when you say i'm going to use object oriented design they have to follow the object oriented principles right so reverse is not true so the correct answer to this question was yes and no i'm surprised that none of you has given the right answer none of you one of you have given the partially correct answer they gave yes to that apart from that everybody gave the reverse answer okay anyways now the clear now the difference between object oriented programming and object oriented design clear to all one moment guys i'll answer the questions but just want to make sure everybody is clear object oriented programming and object oriented design are not same object oriented design are a certain set of principles certain type of patterns which ideally you should follow not everybody follows let me give a very simple example i'm pretty much sure everybody will relate to this while you are driving it's usually recommended that you keep within a certain speed limit right or let's say when you're taking a turn overturn if you're taking overturn overtaking someone you usually do it from the right I'm not sure how i think in india india is right driven so yeah it should be done from the right right and because india is left driven so when you are overtaking from the right that is the design principle that is a certain rules that is certain protocols but when you are driving you may or may not follow that right i can you can say hey, i am going to drive i am going to overtake from the left you cannot stop it it's against the rules definitely it's against the principles definitely but it's not like you can stop somebody from doing it same this is object oriented programming you can write any program which may or may not follow the object oriented design principles i think this example should clear everything this part clear to all this example just came into my mind right now so i just gave it i think this should clear it everything all of this is clear okay one moment one moment we can mimic object oriented programming way of coding in go as well yes mimic object oriented way of programming in go as well okay like we have struts interface how do we define functional programming then? okay when you say object oriented programming way of coding in go the four pillars are never implemented technically in go of course you can have function a function can make to another call to another function you can struts make a call to another struct right but you can never say that my struct is extending another struct those kind of thing this is not inheritance this is not polymorphism no abstraction no encapsulation right so those pillars of object oriented programming are not implemented in functional programming that is the baseline or that is a criteria right of course data can happen flow there functional programming has its own advantages object oriented programming have their own advantages so struts interface does not means they will give the same advantages clusters yes they can do the same work but they will not fall under the category of inheritance polymorphism abstraction and encapsulation why do we call it oop if we don't follow object oriented design okay same example that i just mentioned driving is given to the user rules are set for the user they may or may not follow them 
object oriented programming was created first that hey this is how you write a program then people realized okay not every program is a good program so we should have some certain principles we should have some certain protocols we should have some certain design later object oriented design coming still you cannot control the user from writing the code they want they want to write a messy code they will write the messy code right so not every code is a good code that's why i'm explaining even if you don't follow object oriented design object oriented programming just gives you the program that you have written to using the particular programming language or the features of that programming language that's it all right guys this part clear to all this part clear to all okay if this part is clear now we'll go to next part which is just marking your pen how does the companies like meta google make sure devs follow object oriented design print correctly okay i have worked in these two companies i'll refer from that but generally speaking any company pretty much for sooner or later they follow the same process the process might be called internally differently but majorly how it works is that any kind of code that you are sending into the production even not in production sit one sit two or lower environment whatever you call it internally c1 c2 c3 we called it in facebook any code that you are going through it goes through a simple code review process while writing the code review process it will be reviewed by other engineers senior engineers or whoever is the code reviewer right that places you have to make through it if your question is like around code reviews and all and how do you make sure object and design strictly so that is specifically said so every code base or every repository they have their standards technically speaking every repository and every product have their standards whatsapp has a very different code base standards compared to facebook as a product versus instagram right so specific to a team specific to a repository specific to a product you have to follow certain protocols and that is how we follow not just object oriented design there are thousands of the design patterns you have to follow right so those you can be fixed according to that tools code review is always manual code review is manual deployment is has to be automated right but the code that you are sending it should be done in service companies in india even if it's just some changes to junior developer they won't follow due to lack of time no comments on that and i don't think i should put any comment on that right but okay as a junior dev and i don't technically i don't create a difference between junior dev versus senior dev eventually for engineer to me is an engineer right so if you want to be a good engineer don't just like that i will become a senior engineer then i will run certain things if you are a good engineer irrespective of wherever you are in your career you should always know the things which are right irrespective of which company you are working on or whatever project you are working on that's what my philosophy is okay let's talk about classes and objects then we'll go further we won't spend much time here because class and objects again it's a very basic thing and you guys would have been studying since school time what are classes and what are objects let's make it. what do you mean by classes classes means we always call class before even move to class let's start with objects because that's what i told you in your schools and colleges lot of things would have been told wrong to you if not wrong completely it will not be told to you let's start with objects first what makes an object what is the definition of an object Come on, guys. Be quick. Simple one-line answer. You can message to everyone. Very basic things I'm asking, so nothing too sensitive. What is object in object-oriented programming? Instance of a type. Instance of a type. What is a type? Object is an instance of a class. I just want the definition of object. I don't want any class. Can you define object without using class? Basically, that. memory located on stack or heap storing values i need the basic definition what makes an object type can be anything okay that is what i was explaining object okay let's start with class because that's how you've been told in school but technically that is not the right way it should not be top down approach it should always be bottom up approach but anyways what is a class class you call as blueprint right blueprint or template of of objects that's what you have studied in school 
And that is technically incorrect because it should not be top down, it should be bottom up. It has to be bottom up. What is object? Object is something. I'll keep it like this, just like you have studied in school. Very good. Okay. When I say school, I'm referring to college because school refers to college here. Okay. Blueprint or template of a class, and then you compare object is what? Object is my instance of a class. Now, moving to this part. What is actually class? Class itself is not a real world entity. It's not a real world entity. What makes it a real world entity is object. Okay. Now try to understand this difference. What do I mean by real world entity? Anything which you create a blueprint or a template which does not exist, which does not exist, that is a class. It is just a blueprint. That's why it is called blueprint. It is not there in reality. Object is something which is there in the reality. Okay. Now, object which you have been reading like class, technically it is incorrect. So the right definition is object is made up of two things, which we call as data members and member function. In your colleges, in your schools, you have been always told class is made up of this, which is fundamentally wrong. Class is just a blueprint. You cannot say class is a combination of data member and member function. Object is a combination of data member and member function. But for your understanding, if you want to put the class here, totally fine. What is data members? Let's start it one by one. Data members are information. Information means what? Information means any values, any data values, data variables, or let's say constants, enums, etc. That is what you call as data members. Okay. What do you mean by member functions? Member functions means behavior. When you combine the data member with member functions or when you combine the properties with the attributes, that is what you call as an object. A blueprint of this object is called class and that is what I'm calling as bottom up. In entire majority of the schools, even in my colleges, they were referred as class is the combination of data member and member function, which is incorrect, which is fundamentally incorrect. But in many books, you will see this definition. So I'm not saying that you should not follow it. If that helps you understand, well and good. But technically speaking, understand it in a very in a real life world, class does not even exist. It is just a blueprint. It does not exist in real life entity. In real life entity, you just have an object. If you make a template out of those objects, that will become a class. Okay. Anyways, so this data members, which is information, these are called my attributes. And this member functions, which defines my behavior, they are called properties. Okay. So these are my functions. Okay. Getters, setters, whatever kind of functions you want, they come in member functions. So my object is nothing. It's a combination of data member member function and my class is what? My class is just a blueprint. This is the theoretical definition. Now understanding the practical definition, example in a real world scenario. Okay. I want to make different class. So my class, let's say car. I want to make about different cars. So they, they have a class. Now, what attributes I want? And what behavior I want, I can describe it. Right. What attributes I want? Every car will have a wheel. It will have, let's say, number of wheels, for example. It will have a color. It will have engine horsepower, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. These are my attributes. These are my data members. Every car is going to have their values. They can put in a data structure, they can be analyzed. What are the properties or behavior? Behavior can be like accelerate top speed, et cetera, et cetera. Even that is not also a top speed, drive, and what else, stop. All of these can be function. Click on accelerate, click on drive, click on stop. They are defining the properties or they are defining the behavior of my particular class. They are defining the attributes. These are going to be constant. These are not something in action. These are something which is in action, okay? Now, if I talk about objects, now what will happen? Till the moment it is a class, it is all, all in the blueprint. It is nothing created in the real world. The moment I cross created object, let's say I created object one, car C1. 
and that car see when i make whatever car i want to make let's say new car and i make tesla that is going to have different set of attributes different set of behavior okay this is my first object car c2 car c3 this one i make a beamer and this one i take a mercedes okay all these objects will have a very different values of these attributes and features. Some of this might be same, might not be same, but will have only different values of attributes and future. This is the real life example. Till the moment you just create a class, it does not exist, it does not occupy space. The moment you create an object, that is when it will occupy space. I think that definition somebody would have told, instance of a class which will allocate the memory. That is correct. You allocate the memory only when you create the object, class itself will not create a memory. That is correct. But fundamental difference which I wanted to make you sure is that it's a combination of data members and member functions. Object is the real world entity. Class is not a real world entity. It's just a blueprint of the object. This part clear to all, let me clear in the chat. This part clear to all, let me clear in the chat. These words, data members and member functions, again, I'm repeating are very important. Because that's what makes a class or an object, right? Data members, you call as attributes. Member function, you call as properties. And that's it. That's it. Everything you need in software engineering. What kind of values you want to store, how you want to store, that's it. Nothing else. Everything revolves around this only. Why I'm mentioning to that? Okay. I'm going to take a case study. Then we're going to dip down into it and then we'll move. Before I move there, everybody is crystal clear what is uh, attribute and what is a property attribute means something which i can probably use for a storage or as a reference property means which defines the behavior of my object this part clear to all this part clear to all the difference between attribute and properties is very important to understand okay if this part is clear let's start with a simple question or an exercise for you. I make a simple object, human. Okay. Which all of us are. Tell me just two attributes and two properties. That's it. Nothing else. Attribute is data members again. And properties is member functions. Anything that you can think of, just two properties. Tell me about two attributes and tell me about two properties of an object human, a class human and instance of human, whatever you want to call. Okay. Okay. Let's cover it quickly. Very simple attribute that you can cover with any human is, let's start with height and weight. Anything you can take, no doubt about it. I'm just simply two properties I'm talking. What properties you can think about? What are the features? What are the properties which defines a human? Something which a human can do. And everything else can also do, but very basic properties. So any kind of activities they're able to achieve, that is what you call as properties. Something which they have, that is called data member, right? So a human, what you can do? You can eat definitely. I'm just defining it as a function because they're a property. Yeah. You can walk, you can run, whatever you want to call. This is clear to all because this understanding is very important. This might look very basic to you, but trust me, fundamentals should be very strong. If fundamentals are not strong, you won't be able to understand all the complex systems. This part is clear. Anything which they possess, which they already have, these are attributes. Anything which defines them or their behavior, that is called properties. Very basic things of attribute and properties. Okay. All right. Now, if this is clear, now we move to our next part, which is a case study. This part is also done. Moving this here. Now I'll start with this. This is something called NVT technique. And that we are going to cover via case study. Okay. What do you mean by NVT technique first? Let's understand that. And then we'll talk about which case study we're talking about. What is NVT full form? NVT full form is noun, verb, technique. Okay. 
I know some of you guys would be thinking, why are we having English? This is not English class. We are just going to discuss noun and verb, right? Noun and verb technique. What is the purpose of this noun and verb technique? This technique is very efficient whenever you are analyzing a particular problem statement, okay? In a problem statement, you are not clear which part will be a data member, which part will be a member function, right? What will be a behavior? What will be a property? In that case, this technique can be very helpful. And it's very easy. Whenever you analyze any problem statement, you can go through it and very quickly you can understand, okay, my class will have this as a data member. It will have this as a member function. That's it. That is going to be very helpful. Your noun represents what? Noun represents your basically objects or classes. And what else? Your verb represent what? Your verb represents behavior. Repeating this again, in any problem statement, your noun represents your classes or objects and your verb represents your behavior. Now let's have understanding with a simple case study. How does that case study looks like? Let's quickly come here. Let's say the case study is talk about Udemy classes or Udemy diagram. It's very easy to understand because majority of what I've used Udemy classes case study. Now, what happens is a user goes to the website. I'm writing the I'm writing the entire case study. Goes to the website and selects the batch slots for the classes he or she wants to take. Part one. Part two, you will add them to cart. Part three, you will check out and make the payment. And then get a confirmation of classes or courses, whatever you want to call, being enrolled. Simple case study, right? Case study, you know, make last case study, five, six, four. Okay. Now let's try to understand that. What are these case study? What do you mean by that? This is a simple Udemy classes case study that we have made. What is this case study? This is explaining just me a user behavior. What is expected of the user behavior? So users will go to udemy.com, their website. They will select the exact batch they need. They will select the exact class they need. Now, I understand some of you guys will say there is no batch. Udemy has recently introduced live classes also. That's when I'm also preparing the course there. So their batch slots will do what? You can select a specific slot and you can select the specific class that you want to take. So it does not need to be offline. They have the live classes as well now. Then you can add them to cart. You can check out and make the payment and then you can get the confirmation of the classes being enrolled. This part clear to all? This part clear to all? Simple case study. Out of this case study, you guys tell me what are going to be the noun of it. Noun means something that I can map with classes. If for this problem statement, let's say you have to design, you have to do a low level design for Udemy for this case study or for this scenario, what do you think would be the classes in your system and why? Repeating it again, let's make it courses, it becomes easy. Courses, it becomes easy. What would be the different classes in your system and why the case study is in front of you. So all you have to do is just use your basic knowledge of English. What are the different nouns here? Those different nouns will be the classes in your system. Obviously, not everything will become a class. So use some common sense as well, right? What are going to be the list of classes? Let me know in the chat. Find the nouns in this paragraph and tell me which one would be the classes. Come on, guys, should not take this much time. What are the nouns here? Quickly, simple basic English. The first thing is that I have a user who is my noun, definitely. What else? 
user goes to the website and select the batch slots. So my slot become a noun here. Which slot you're going to type? Number three. What else? For the courses he or she wants to take. Courses will become a noun. What else? Add them to the cart. Cart will become a noun. Number five. Check out and make the payment. Will check out be a class? Will check out be a class? Yes or no? Check out is a class or check out is a behavior? An action or a class? Exactly. Check out is an action, right? So check out is not going to be a class. Check out and make the payment. Will the payment be a class? Or the payment is an action? Of course, same reason. Confirmation of course is being enrolled, right? This four part will be there. So as of now, we need this four one. Did I miss something here? No, I think this is fine. Okay. User, slot, courses, cart. These four are going to be my nouns or these are going to be my classes. Okay. That's it. That is for the noun part. Coming to the verb part. My verb will represent my behavior or basically my functions in my classes. What are going to be different behavior? Quickly tell me in the chat. 30 seconds, guys. Don't take time more than 30 seconds. We have to finish a lot. So quickly tell me what are the verbs that you see in this paragraph. Those verbs will actually boil down to different behaviors or the functions. Be quick. Cool, guys. Be quick. Select, add to cart, check out, pay, all of this. Enroll and all. That's fine. All of this is correct. Okay. One thing somebody has mentioned is that go to website. Guys, go to website technically is not a behavior because that's the first thing anybody will do. Yes, when you're creating the instance of user class, there you will mention that go to the website. Okay, that's what I'm not mentioning here in the works. But the very first thing is that they're going to select the slot, as you can see in the first line. Select the slot. That is a verb. What else? Add them to cart. That is a verb. What else? Check out and make the payment. So check out and make the payment. This entire is a verb. Number four. Confirmation of course is being enrolled. So course is being enrolled. That is a verb. Just enrolled is a verb, but it's okay. Let's write it this way. These will become my classes. Inside these classes, there will be different behaviors here. Now, which behavior will go to this class? That is a common sense that we are going to discuss. But as of now, this part clear to all. This is something which will be given to you. Okay. And from there, you have to convert and boil down which classes are required out of these classes, which functions are required. And right. That is something which we are learning right now, one by one. Is this part clear to all? Let me know. Any doubt in this? Let me know. Easy, no doubt so far. Come on, let's be quick. All clear. Do NV. It's NVT, but okay. It's designing database also. No, no, no. Database has nothing to do with this. Database is all about the data, right? Database is all about the data. What kind of data we are storing there? Okay, this is about, just about figuring out nouns for classes and verbs for functions. That's it. Now, if this part is clear, what is the next part? The next part is to make a class diagram. What is a class diagram? What are the different classes involved there inside these classes? What are the different functions involved there? Data members and functions both. Okay. We should define payment as an interface that would be implemented by card payment, payment, etc. Where does payment fit in here? Okay. Payment definitely can be an interface which can be implemented either by credit card, UPI, whatever it is, totally fine. As of now, we have not gone that deep, right? We are not going to the interface level. We are going step by step. Understand what we have done. We got a user statement. From that user statement or from the case study, we define what classes I need, what object I need. I need to make these classes. Then I need to define the functions in it. Then I need to give the functionality to each function, a functionality to each class. Then I will go for individual code level part. So currently, as I told you in the design, 
we have not reached at this part. Whatever you're asking is this part. As of now, we are here, somewhere here. We haven't even defined the relationship between the classes. So all of that will go step by step. Okay. Cool. Now, what is the next part? Once you have understood that, hey, these are going to be the classes in my system and these are going to be behaviors of my system. Next, you do is create a class diagram. And then you make a different, then you make a relationship between class diagram, you define the cardinality, so on and so forth and so forth. Association, relation, whatever kind of it is, aggregation, implementation, whatever it is. But let's start with the very basic, then we'll go step by step. So let's start with our class diagram. I'll take you back to draw.io and we'll start drawing our class diagram. I'm just going to keep it here. I'm just going to copy this. You want to keep it, keep it. You want to delete it, delete it. Your call. Okay. I'm just going to make my classes here. Copy this, paste it, and copy. It. I'm just paste it. Okay. What are the classes we decided? I'm just going to write it down to. These are the four classes we decided. Let's just copy this entire thing. Okay. Somewhere here I will take it. Let me just take a text diagram. Okay, I just made the text and I let me see. Now right, this will become too slow, but I think that defines it. It's totally fine. Yep, looks better now. We'll just move it to the right. Okay. Focus on this one. This should be sufficient enough. Anyways, you can change that syntax part later. Okay. We're going to start with the classes first. And once we're clear with the classes, then we're going to talk about our functionalities. So in my classes, I need what? A user, a slot, a courses, and a card. Okay. So this will become a user. Let's finish one class one by one. You see a line here. There's a line between. On the top, you have the data members and the line between, you have the member functions. Okay. Those who are not able to see or not able to interpret, let me highlight it again. I'm talking about this line. Every class diagram, you will see this line. Every class diagram, right? So this line tells you what? This line tells you on the top, you have the data members, right? Or which you call as, which you call as noun here. And this is where we have member functions, which we call as behaviors. So this is verb and this is noun. Now will become the class, but technically let's put it here. These are just going to be my data members and these are going to be my member functions. These are my attributes and these are going to be my behavior. Is this part clear? In every class diagram, class name is on the top. Then you have the attributes, then you have a line, then you have the members, data mem then you have the member functions, which are at behavior. Is this part clear to all? Okay, if this part is clear, let's clear this. And now let's make it for our user class. For my user class, what do I need? I will need a name. I will need to define it as a string, right? What else I need? I'm just going to make it here. Okay, uh, not here, here. Okay, what else I need? I need, let's say the age of the user that is string and yeah that's it if i want to keep an email i can keep an email and make it string that's all i needed for my user name age and email right what are the functions i need from the user obviously there's going to be a constructor and 
just to keep it the return type as void. The syntax that you use is for every data member, you define their syntax, what are the data types they're going to use, and you're also going to define to define for the functions also. What is going to be the return type of the function, so and so forth. Okay. What else? I can use my get name and set name. So simple getters and setters. My get name will be returning me a string. And then what? Just copy this, paste it here, bring it here. Uh, not here. Set name will be setting as a string, will be returning your board. That's it. No, looks better now. All right. This is our user class name, age, Email, these are the three data types in string. And what are the what are the parameters or what are the behaviors that I'm going to define? What is going to be a constructor, then getters and setters for it. Is that part clear to all? If you want me to create for all four classes, I can create for all four classes, but I think the idea should be clear to everybody now. If you want, I can create for all four classes, user, cart, courses, and as well as slot. Everybody clear how to make a simple class diagram at least just the data members and member functions in it. You guys can complete, I assume you guys can complete first lot, cart and courses. Do we include input parameters? So we ignore it in the class diagram. Input parameters means what for a function? Yeah, we do. You can ignore it also. It's not like a hard and fast rule. It's better if you do. If you want to ignore it, you can ignore it. But do mention this bracket symbol that denotes it's a function. Okay. I've seen many class diagram, many developers, they don't include it. Sometimes the parameters are very large, so it makes sense also, right? It is supposed to show you the functionality. It's, it's not supposed to show you the implementation details. So it's fine. But if it's just one or two values, definitely show it. All right. Do we have to refine getters and setters? I mean, it's obvious, right? Yes, it's obvious, but it's good to mention. Well, technically speaking, if you don't want to mention, that's also fine. If you just want to mention only the functionality base, that is also fine. There is no hard and fast tool to define a class diagram. Understand this. UML diagrams, there are certain protocols, fine, but these are not hard and fast. And this is the way only a class diagram is written or this is the way only class diagram. No, there is nothing like that. Yes, the relationship is hard and fast. You cannot have certain kind of relationship between certain classes. That is hard and fast. But how you represent a class diagram, that is not any hard and fast. I've seen some people, they don't even write this also. For example, data type, what is the return type? They don't write it. It's fine. But as a good engineer, you should follow the process. That's what I recommend. All right. So this is one I've created. I assume that you guys have understood the process on the top half. Attributes on the bottom up, we have the behavior. Okay. Technically speaking, yes, it's a must, but I've seen many developers not writing it. Okay. How will I know other team members will know what we will return? For that case, we have other diagrams to be created. Okay. But, anyways, the first part contains the data members, the second part contains the member functions, which we call as behavior. Ideally speaking, yes, this is the way you should define a class diagram. No hard and fast tools, but as a good engineer, this is what I would recommend as a template. Okay. I have done it for one class, which is the user like user class. You can make it for slot. You can make it for courses. You can make it for cart. Okay. Everybody clear so far. Okay. I'm just making for who will create this class diagram. Usually each dev will get this before he starts coding a story. Each dev will get this before he starts coding a story. Okay. In general, how SDLC works is first you have the requirement phase, right? Either you're following Kanban or you're following Agile, whatever you're following, they fall under both in the sprints, right? The name can be different of the sprints. 
what will usually happen is first you define the scope of the project so when you're defining the scope of the project that is when you'll go for high level design first once your high level design is approved after certain to and fro's that is when you will go to the low level design that is where all of these uml diagrams will come into the picture who will create this diagram that depends on organization to organization project to project usually any developer i'm not talking about seniority here any developer who is given the task to make this this will be reviewed by their TL or senior engineers or principals or distinguished whosoever is depending upon the priority of the project. And once this get approved, then only you will move to the development part. So agile can, when you will make a user story, you'll create a Jira ticket and so on and so forth will start. That is how it process. But all of this definitely has to be and must be done before you even jump to coding. Coding is always the last step in software engineering. Remember that. Of course, before testing, no doubt about it. Who will create this diagram? Okay. All right. Now let's move to next part. Just one more I'm creating. The rest of the two you guys can create. I'm just creating one more, which is cart. In my cart as a class, what do I need? In my cart as a class, first thing I need is which courses you have enrolled. So there you go, courses. That courses is going to be what? It's going to be area of my courses class. So let's make this as courses. This is going to be area of my courses class because in my cart, you can add multiple courses, right? So this is going to be area of courses. In terms of data members, I don't need anything else. So I can delete it. In terms of my member functions, what do I need? First, in a cart, you can add a course or you can delete a course. Common sense, simple cart, right? So you can add a course. So there you will be giving a course. This will return me a void. Simply delete a course also. Okay. And that's it. What else? There's one more thing that you will need. Yeah. One more thing that you will need is that get card total or something like that. Get card total get out amount, which will return your number. That's it. These two class diagram I have created. Checkout is okay. That I will come to, but it's, it's good that you remind it. Checkout should be done at cart level or checkout should be done at user level. Well, get card total is checkout only, so nothing to worry about. I'll ask that question again because it will confuse us some people. So let's keep it this way. Um, I think this is fine. All right. These two classes I have created, user and cart. I assume that now at least you should are very clear with how to create a class diagram. I have not talked about relationship. I have not talked about any cardinality. Just how do you make a class diagram? This is the best practices. This is something I would highly recommend you to follow. And if you will follow it, definitely it's going to set standard for other developers in your team as well. So that's something I would highly recommend. Creating class diagram part is clear to all. Just let me know in the chat. Creating class diagram part is clear to all. Okay. Now we move to the next part. So should I take a screenshot? I think it can save in one moment. Yeah, I think this test or trio I can save as. Okay. All right. I'll just clear the rest of the stuff. Then I will save as I'll share in the chat, right? So you guys can follow the same. Apart from code review, do you use any static code analysis tools to maintain the standard of the code? There are many. There are many where you can find the signals, smells, and all of these things, whether they are following or not. There's automated analysis also, which can tell you what is the complexity. Is the code is too complex? Outlining all of those things. So those tools are available. Okay. And of course, when we say standard of the tool, I'm also means about test driven development and domain driven development. So automated test cases, code coverage, all of these are also mentioned. Okay. In Facebook and Google, we had this we had this rule that if your code coverage is less than 80%, your PR will be rejected. Forget about rejected, you, you will not be able to raise a PR. So that's also one thing. And depends, I'm not saying all teams follow that. Depends on team to team, depends on particular agile team to agile team. Inside a particular org also, we have different agile teams, just like in any other company. So what is the meaning of code coverage? Okay. Number of lines of code you write versus how many of those are covered in terms of your test cases. 
or in terms of your so test cases is a generic word test cases can be unit test cases it can be integration test cases so either you have ut's or it's whenever they're executed what is the number of lines of code which is covered that is what you call as code coverage you write 100 lines of code right but when you write the test cases and you say that i've covered everything in the test cases ideally you should write the test cases before and then you should move to the code that's why it is called test driven development event driven development test driven development you will see all of these architecture patterns or best design principles and development practices all of this use every organization do they use sonar cube there are some other tools also there are other tools also uh, i think devops side people can tell you better but as a developer i've heard about sonar cube but there are many other tools also for sure uh, you can google it like tools like sonar cube and all in the artifactories and repos that's what i've understood but i'm not primarily worked on the devops side so some devops engineer or sr engineer can tell you the best okay cool so this part is clear noun and verbs next we have shown the class diagram this part is done image i'm putting for reference okay next part case study done class diagram using draw.io done okay now we'll talk about different class relations right and then after understanding the different class relation we'll talk about two things which responsibility should be assigned to the class and why and then how it sorry and then how we define the relationship between the classes okay let's go one by one so relations between the classes But code coverage you mean test coverage or is it different yes code coverage means test coverage the test you have written how much lines of code they cover okay now we start with relations between classes all right this is also an interesting part here we'll talk about cardinality and others but let's go one by one let's not jump into the steps okay what do you mean by relations between the classes as of now we have understood we are going step by step okay and the first thing is we got a real life problem from the real life problem we segregated nouns and verbs nouns become my classes verbs become my behavior so now i know from if you give me a real life problem or simply a paragraph of any real life problem i can make a class diagram out of it okay at this moment we can do that we don't know what particular relation these classes will have with each other is it going to be inheritance is it going to be association is going to be composition aggregation that we don't know but we just know that this is going to happen we can make the class diagrams for it how these classes will interact with each other that we don't know okay so let's see relation between different classes in our system okay it includes association composition well they are part of association but just writing aggregation and addition is mostly inheritance but let's go one by one now what do you mean by i'll show you that diagram also a bit later let's start one by one in association and all okay now starting with this let's start a has a relationship okay a simple has a relationship if i make a class customer okay and then i have a class credit card very simple example i have taken you guys tell me one customer can have more than one credit card yes or no one customer can have more than one credit card yes or no so if a customer exists they can have credit card right if there is no customer there is no credit card agree 
if customer itself is not present, there is no credit card. Yes or no? Right? If there are no customer, what would you make credit card for? That is called that is called your composition. Okay. I'm writing the same here. Has the relationship is defined into two parts. It can be composition, it can be aggregation. So I'm first talking about come or let's write it this way. Now this is also fine. Composition. Inside that composition, two things. Customer can have multiple credit cards. Okay. And without a customer, credit card cannot exist in individual. Why this is the composition? This is a simple has a relationship. I'll play it like this. Has a relationship. A customer has a credit card. If there is no customer, there's no credit card. Okay. This is what you call as composition relationship. This class customer has a relationship with this class credit card, which is of type composition. Means one customer can have multiple credit cards. So if I talk about the cardinality, I'm going to define like one is to n. One customer can have multiple credit cards. But if there is no customer, credit card in itself cannot exist. Credit card itself cannot exist. It needs a customer for it to exist, right? So there's no point of credit card without having a customer. This type of has a relationship is called composition. Is this part clear to all? Is this part clear to all? This type of relationship has a relationship is called composition. There is one more type of has a relationship that is called what? Aggregation. What is aggregation? Let's take example. We talk about cart. We talked about courses. I'm just using the same example. There we go. Okay. Now, look at this example. My one cart can contain multiple courses. So this is also one is to n. No doubt about it. But can my courses exist without being in the cart? Yes or no? Can my courses exist individually without being added to the cart? Yes or no? Of course, yes, right. When you go to Amazon.com, you don't add it to object. That doesn't mean that particular object does not exist. They do exist, right? So a cart can have multiple courses in it. No doubt. One is to one relationship cardinality we talked about. Even without a cart, my course can exist and will exist. Okay, can exist. This is called aggregation. Okay, so when you talk about the word aggregation, be best assured that whatever the one is one relationship you are having, those values will be aggregated and transferred. Okay, but that doesn't mean, despite of having a has a relationship. So my cart has a course. Why we call it has a? My customer has a credit card. My cart has a course. Despite in the aggregation, we know that despite if there is no card, there will still be courses. They will can act as their individuality. But in a has a relationship, customer has a credit card. But if there is no customer, there is no credit card. Okay, so they cannot exist as individual, right? That is the difference between aggregation versus composition. Both of them, both of them are has a relationship. Is this part clear? There is third kind of relationship, which is called is a relationship. Okay. This is a relationship usually defines inheritance. Usually I've said the word, right? So whenever we talk about is a relationship, majorly without card, course can exist. Yes. If you don't add a course, but no one can buy. Yeah, that is correct. So we are not talking about, okay, when we talk about two different classes, we are only talking about the relationship between them. We're not talking about the third relationship. For example, checkout can be another thing. Adding to cart, enrolling is a different part, right? We're not concerned about it. We're just concerned what is the relation between the two classes, not the relationship between the behavior of the classes. That's it. Okay. Now, 
in my is a relationship what do i need in my is a relationship we usually refer to the one which is given by the inheritance for example let's take my class which is courses okay now inside my class courses let's just put it like this it can be any kind of course right so i say there is one mern batch course and there is one system design course so if you observe the relationship between these classes one particular class can have many particular classes so this is also one is to n one particular class can have many is a so this is is a my class my course is a modern batch course my course is a system design course that's how you read it right so that is why you call it is a relationship this is simple inheritance as you can see this is the parent class these are the child classes this is what you call it is a relationship is this part clear is this part clear all is a relationship can be converted to a has a relationship i remember reading this in block but i did not understand can you give me an example all is a relationship can be converted to has a relationship ideally you should never do that because you completely destroy the principle of object oriented design okay i remember this in some block probably what they mean to extend i have not read that block which you mentioned probably what they meant to say is if you don't want to implement the inheritance you can still use association aggregation or association aggregation or composition to implement that you know if you don't want to implement the inheritance but it's a very specific case where you don't want to implement the inheritance okay so for that blog i need to read through it and then i can explain better okay as of now this part clear to all has a relationship has two categories one is called composition in composition one is to one relation or one is to one relation doesn't matter the thing is that if the other part does not exist then that that part also cannot exist if there is no customer there is no credit card as simple as that okay in the case of aggregation of as a relationship despite of the first party existing second party can still exist right so even if i don't have a card my course can still exist as an ind individual entity and then we finally talked about a is a relationship is a relationship talks about inheritance So inside an inheritance, we have class, we have courses. Is a relationship versus has a relationship. That's what we discuss. This part clear to all? Let me know in the chat. Association is about cardinality. Or give us example of has a relationship. Association is about cardinality. Any relationship is about card. Yes, association is majorly about cardinality. That's correct. I'll come to association a bit later. I'm completing as composition, aggregation, and inheritance first. Then I talk about association because association contains everything. Phone guys, be quick. Okay, composition clear, aggregation clear, inheritance clear is relationship. Clear. I'll give you some classes. You guys tell me what is the relation between them. is it a composition is it aggregation or is it an inheritance okay i'm just giving you some classes you guys tell me there's a class credit card and there's a class payment just tell me one thing what is the relationship between credit card and payment is it a aggregation is it a comp composition or it going to be inheritance aggregation composition or inheritance let me know in your chat and please explain the reason also i just don't want the answer i want the reason also this time you can change your message directly to me because i want everybody to think and then answer okay one more thing relationship between one class to second and second to one is not same what do i mean by that i made a very specific arrow i want the relation between credit card to payment 
I didn't say the relationship between payment to credit card. There's a difference between them. Okay. Now, I want you to think and then come up with the answer. Is it going to be an aggregation, which is a has a, has a again, or is it going to be a user? Think and then tell me. I'm giving you one minute to all of you guys. Please change your message directly to me and then give me the answer. I just don't want the answer. I want the reason with it. You can just mention it a few words. That's totally fine. I don't need the complete paragraph. There's enough time. This is I told you very frequent. I told you very honestly and very frequently before going there, before giving you the time is that relationship between one class to another is very different from second class to first one. First to second relationship is different from second to first. So it's not that difficult. Just put these words and try to understand whether it makes sense or not. If I say, if I say, credit card has a payment. Does it make sense that credit card has a payment? No, it doesn't, right? What else? If I say credit card is a payment, well, technically, payment is a credit card. Or technically speaking, if I'm talking about relationship between payment to credit cards, then I can talk about, yes, it can be something, an interface or a abstract class, and then I can implement the credit card. That is one thing which makes sense. If I'm talking about the relation from payment to credit card, but if I see the relationship from credit card to payment, neither has a fits nor a is a fits. Okay. Now let me read your comments. Okay. Aggregation, the composition payment cannot exist without credit card. Payment cannot exist without credit card. Well, that is an incorrect statement because as of now, there might be different other payment schemes, right? Because both can exist independently, debit card or a UK class can also have the payment. That's by aggregation. Okay. Both can exist without each other. Okay. Payment aggregation can do multiple payments. Composition has a is a relationship. Majority of you said aggregation, then said composition. One or two of you have said is a relationship. Okay. The correct answer is none of them. And that is the reason I asked this question. Understand this again. None of these words will fit it. None of the aggregation, composition, or is a will fit it. Again, I'm repeating relation between payment to credit card is different from credit card to payment, just to be clear. What actually fits it here? If you look in a very real life scenario, what does credit card does with a payment? Credit card just creates a payment or completes a payment. That's it. Now, this creates a does not fit in the category of is a or a has a. So, not every relation, not every relation can be put inside just has a or is a. There is something else called as association also. You cannot just compare two classes. These classes are anyways connected. They have some relation. But if I take entirely two different classes, for example, I talked about a class named food and I talked about a class named table. I mean, table is still connected to food. It's a completely different thing. Table, class name bus. Bus is nowhere connected with food, right? So you cannot just create a relationship between any two classes by using composition or aggregation. Okay. If we reverse the class payment, then definitely it's a user relationship. Okay. Anyways, coming back to this, not everything can be fit into composition, aggregation, and inheritance. That's what I was referring. We have one more term also, which is called association, which we are going to read up right now. Okay. I told you this example because there is one more thing apart from these relations, which is association. Now we come back here. We talked about this and let's come back here. Okay. Relations between classes. Credit card is a type of payment, right? So it says a relationship. Payment to credit card will be as a relationship. Payment to credit card will be as a relation. Credit card to payment will not be there. Okay. Now, association, inside that, we have composition and aggregation. There is dependency. There is generalization, which you will very rarely use. And same for realization. Good to know, but you will never use it most probably. Anyways, what is association? Association. What is it? It's just a relationship relationship in a let's call it structural relationship. If we are defining it's not behavioral, it's a structural relationship in a system 
which in which different objects are linked within the system okay structure relationship in a system in which different objects are linked within the system okay so if i talk about a venn diagram let's talk about simple examples represented by a line between classes okay followed by an arrow represented by a line between classes followed by an arrow that navigates the direction okay this is the definition this is the second part and third part we can specify the cardinality cardinality or multiplicity of a association anything else that i want to change relationship between objects that is fine okay one more thing exhibits a binary behavior compares between two different classes and tells what is the relationship between them now let's take an example okay i'm just going to take an example and i'm going to show you the diagram Here we are, draw dot io again. I'm quickly make a relationship here. So for that, I will need a text diagram. All of you guys can see my Chrome screen. Just let me know in the chat in the meantime. Come on, guys. You guys can see my screen. Just there. okay. You guys can. I'm just going to create. Simple down here. Here is where we talk about association. Okay, so it will easy to take screenshot and share with you guys. Let's make a very simple class. One class is already a student. I'm going to make one class as teacher. Okay, student number, average mark, whatever is there to keep it. Teacher, I can say name, which will be string type. Then what else? Email you can keep again a string type. And is able to know no classes taken, I can say. That is going to give me a number. And yeah, this much is fine. I don't need any further information. Two classes, teacher and student. How does the relationship between them looks like? Okay. So I'm going to make the complete diagram here. Here I take the arrow. I just connect it here and put it here. Okay. What else do I need to put? I need to put here text one dot dot star. What does this one dot dot star means? As we say one is to one relationship, but we don't write one is to one. We talk about in general, this is cardinality. This is one is to one relationship. But when we have to actually represent in a class diagram, we represent it like this. Okay. What does that mean? One single teacher can has multiple students. This part clear to all? This part clear to all? One particular teacher can have multiple students. That is why it is as one is to n. This part clear? Okay. Similarly, if I talk about the multiplicity or the cardinality of student to teacher, what do you think? It's going to be one is to one or one is to n? One is to one or one is to n? Exactly, it's going to be also one is to n. So this will also become one is to star, one is to n basically. Means what? If I talk about a relationship between a teacher and student, this is going to be an association. Teacher has a student, student has a teacher. Teacher has a student, student has a teacher, right? 
it is one teacher can refer to multiple student one student can be teaching can be taking courses from multiple teachers right that is how the relationship of association works this part clear to all let me clear in the chat This part clear to all. Let me clear on the chat. Okay. Now we are going to deep dive into parts of association, which we already have covered. Okay. On draw dot i. Now inside association, we have two different categories which we already discussed. Okay. Composition. Let me write it like this. Association can be divided into two parts. Composition and aggregation. Okay. So association can be divided into two parts, whether it can be composition, whether it can be aggregation. What is the difference we talked about? In both these cases, Object of one class is owned by object of another class. Okay. When we say has a, so means there is an ownership. One particular class owns the object of another class. Let's take an example back when we talked about this. Customer has a credit card. Customer owns the credit card, correct? Similarly, cart has the courses. Cart, cart and aggregation, cart and courses, they are aggregation, but cart still owns the courses, right? Association aggregation, we talk about relationship in one direction, but in association relationship is bad direction. Not necessarily because composition and aggregation, both are parts of association. They are just specific cases. That's what I'm talking about. But in general speaking, we make in general speaking, we make bidirectional and association and we make unidirectional composition aggregation. But if you look at the Venn diagram, in the VEC diagram, composition aggregation, they are part of the association. I'll show that as well. I'm coming to that only. Okay. In both cases, object of the one class is owned by the object of another class, this part. What else? Only difference is in case of composition, in case of composition, Child object is not the right term to use here, but just mentioning it here. The owned object, not the child object, the owned object does not exist independently. That's what we see in the case of customer and credit card. It does not exist independently. Okay. In case of aggregation, the owned object does exist independently. That's it. That is the only difference. Okay. So aggregation is a special form of association. Composition is a special form of aggregation. Venn diagram. Let me write it here. Aggregation. It's special form of association and association is special form of, sorry, composition is special form of association. Aggregation. So my Venn diagram, how it will look like? My superset is association aggregation inside that I have spatial composition. This is my Venn diagram. Okay. If this is not help, let me put it this way. This is your composition. This is your aggregation. And summarizing all of this is finally your association. I'm just writing aggregation here and AS for association. This is how the Venn diagram looks like. So your association is divided into two categories. It can be composition or aggregation. The difference I just explained in the cases of aggregation and composition, 
composition object child does not exist Ob let's not call it child object let's call it owned object owned object does not exist independently but in the case of aggregation it does exist independently or can exist independently okay moving on to next this part if you look at it that's what we just discussed here in composition credit card cannot exist independently one moment but courses can exist independently that is aggregation combining all of them becomes the association is a is a different thing inheritance is a different thing it does not come under the association okay that would create circulate circular reference if object of one class owned by object of another class and vice versa how to deal with this object of one class owned by object of another class and vice versa okay let's understand when we say owned by owned by does not means i'm going to create inheritance it's not a single it's not going to create any kind of circular reference circular reference you can say parent has child child has the parent again that kind of circulation chip will never happen okay it's a relationship between the classes it's not a dependency that you're creating this part clear inside class a you make an object of b inside class b you make an object of a so yeah what's problem in that what's problem in that circular reference so what is the problem exactly here for the class you can have the object of another class you can implement it that's fine that is not going to create any problem as long as you are not using any function or member function which are not part of the class okay all right i'm not sure i was asked to resolve this circular reference in interview resolve the circular reference in interview might be the question is something else or i'm not sure what was the exact question might be the expectation is that you create an abstract class or you create the parent class then you divide into different child objects and then you pass the objects might be that i need to see the exact question to come up to that okay anyways guys we have roughly seven or eight minutes left i want to cover one last thing which is in the today's class rest of the topics we have already covered so this marking is done this marking is done done and done solid principles is something which will be starting tomorrow we'll discuss that one by one one last thing that i love, would like to cover is which i have kept it for is assigning responsibilities to a class okay we talked about the relationship between the class but which class should be assigned which responsibility that is very very important and part of that will be answered in the solid principles also okay but it's very important to understand what is responsibilities responsibility means behaviors so nothing means responsibility i'm talking about the behavior or the functions although it's not very difficult it's not very difficult to understand which class should contain which function but sometimes it is especially when you have multiple classes you are dealing with a very very large scale system in that case it becomes confusing it's not even confusing it becomes a very mature decision it becomes a very critical decision to understand which functionality should remain at which class and that has a lot of reasoning behind it because if you make an incorrect decision there your entire system will become faulted okay i'll give an example let's talk about a class which is got and a class courses right what kind of relationship they do have quickly tell me in the chat what kind of relationship they do have quickly come on guys we just discussed it what kind of relationship they do have let's make some functions also so let's say add lesson add course get total something like this whatever it is these are the functions here 
inside my course is let's say uh, get course set course whatever something like this okay what kind of relationship they do have they have aggregation they have a has a relationship has a relationship one is to n this is aggregation but if i just make one change you guys let me know which class should implement it and why i'm writing the problem statement think it and then let me know there are certain discount coupons okay which can be applied to certain courses which class should contain discount behavior quickly answer me it's a very simple example it's not that simple it can become complex if i want to make it question is that there are certain discount coupons which can quickly these are certain discount coupons which can be applied to certain courses out of this classes cart or courses should i put discount here discount here or should i put discount here tell me the reasoning behind that as well question is clear to all question is clear to all this, this question was not that tough but i'm surprised some people still have not given the correct answer okay let's see start courses class because each discount can have minimum value maximum discount where it should be at cart level okay i feel both are required discounted card is given to this single course courses discount student course and coming courses one, both both you cannot have fun okay read the problem statement again there are certain discount coupons which can be applied to certain courses repeating certain courses each individual course can have their own discount obviously all courses will not have a discount in that case we'll put the discount value to be zero but which courses who have their discount we need to define in their properties answer will become courses and courses class it should be there okay all right now moving on to this let's quickly move last part that i had is this okay one last question which i want to make is this was the easy part after this class i made three groups in my mind is a is a inheritance as a can be composition or aggregation association combined or unconfused okay explaining again very easily and very yeah association is divided into two parts okay one is aggregation where the child is or where the owned object is independent and one is composition where it is dependent okay this comes under one window inheritance comes under entirely another window they have nothing to do with the association i think that now helps you association it's called a has a relationship both aggregation composition composition individual child component aggregation no of composition no individual child component aggregation individual child component in a return has nothing to do with it has a it is a is a relationship okay so technically there are two categories inside the two categories they have aggregation and composition group 2 and group 3 are same correct they are part of group 2 is a part of group 3 that's the right statement to make okay cool guys we are right on time but i want to give you a homework because since you guys are confusing at the medium one i do want to give you the hard one now so you guys can try it out and then we can discuss in next class okay very basic problem statement is that how does a checkout not less how does the checkout happens question is that let's put it this way okay in which class where you put in which class you will put the checkout functionality 
and this is an interesting one think about it think about amazon think about whatever e-commerce you have to think and let me know option one in the cart class option two in the payment class option three in the customer class why and okay what and why this is you have to answer think about it i'm telling you again it's not a such a easy question as it looks like it's a hard question that's why i've tagged it as hard and if you have understood the class everything about the class and their relationships this question is super easy it's not that difficult it's just you need to analyze what are the classes what is the relation between the classes and where exactly the checkout functionality will be implemented think about it no hurry don't give answer in rush think about it draw the diagrams if you have to and then let me know okay anyways let me quickly revise today's class and then we'll wrap up the today's session so this part also is done tomorrow we are going to start with our solid principles we'll cover the solid principle first we'll work over some of the uml diagrams and that's it that will mark the end of our ld course as well okay Quickly dividing, we first started with OOP versus double OD, object-oriented programming versus object-oriented design. We talked about the difference, modeling a real-world problem versus following up the object-oriented features of a particular language, right? I gave some real-life example also here. Then we move to class and objects. You guys pretty much know it. We talked about it. We talked about NVT technique, which is a noun-verb technique. Noun refers to classes, verb refers to behavior, so on and so forth. Then using the noun-verb technique, we use a case study. Using that case study, we made the class diagram. I'll share the screenshots with you, which we have made. I'll share the draw .io, draw.io file also, so you can directly import the draw.io file. Then we talked about relationship between classes. We talked about relationship between different classes in our system. There we go. Has a relationship, composition, aggregation, is a relationship, and finally association. All of them we discuss one by one. Okay. We've all talked about the Venn diagram, the relationship between the same. Finally, we talked about important part is after you have made the class, after you find out the functionality, after you find out which data members, which member function goes into it, and after defining the cardinality, final part is which particular behavior should be defined to which class. Sometimes it's very easy. For example, if I am making getters and setters, obviously it will go to class. Very basic functionality I'm making, like in a course, if I'm talking about the course name or the course title, obviously the course title will go into the class, right? Set course title, get course title. They will go into the course only. But sometimes it becomes complicated. For example, I told you that this scenario that I want to implement discount for a specific course. Now the question comes, should discount be applied to a cart itself or should be applied to a specific course? I mean, it's the course itself. So answer would be to course itself. Similarly, I make it a hard question is that in which class we'll put the checkout functionality. If I have to write the checkout function, something like this, where it should go? It should go in the cart, it should go in the payment, it should go in the customer. What? Now we'll have a discussion tomorrow. Okay.